Blake's Jerusalem is so well known to us that it's almost like a second national anthem. It has terminated many a boisterous last night of the promenade concerts in London. Sung by innumerable choirs, it stirs the heartstrings. But how many of us pause to consider just what Blake was writing about in the familiar words? And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? He was our great English mystic poet and artist and was quite clear about the following story. A story handed down from one generation to the next by those who have lived in the southwest of Britain for nearly 2,000 years. His Jerusalem, put so beautifully to music by Perry, is a testament to his acceptance of the tradition. In the west of England, at the beginning of the Christian era, a rich trader from Palestine sailed his ships to Cornwall and Somerset in search of tin, copper and lead. He brought with him on the voyage a young companion, it is quite possible that they passed St. Anthony Head, where the lighthouse now stands, entered Falmouth Harbour at this point, and anchored in the sheltered waters near Place Manor, over there. The name of the trader was Joseph of Arimathea. His companion was Jesus of Nazareth. Let us first go back in time a few years before this story took place. The story of Joseph of Arimathea and his young companion in the west of England. Wise men from the east, called Magi in the New Testament, were convinced that they had discovered a coming event of historic importance. Maybe the astrologers of those days, centered at Sipar on the river Euphrates, caused them to focus their study of the heavens in a certain area, in anticipation of a special event. The end result of their studies was a thousand mile journey westward to visit Herod the Great and the religious authorities of the day. These magi and the shepherds who watched their flocks by night became the symbols of the childhood of Jesus, the Christ of history, the long-awaited Messiah of Israel's hopes and deepest longings, narrowed down at that time to the suppressed passions of a people under the heel and dominance of Rome. Strange to relate, there was in fact a most unusual astronomical event at that time. The star of Bethlehem, so dear to our childhood memories of Christmas, could well have been the supernova sighted by Chinese astronomers in 4 BC. A supernova is a sudden nuclear reaction triggered off deep within a star, causing it to burn itself out with millions of times its normal energy output. So bright can it become that it can be seen in broad daylight. In 1603, in Prague, the astronomer Kepler sighted what is called a conjunction of planets in this case, Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation of Pisces. He remembered the statement of a medieval Jewish writer who said that these conjunctions would accompany the appearance of the Messiah. And so Kepler wondered if it were possible that this same conjunction could have been seen at the time of the Nativity. Calculating backwards, he found this to be true. We now know that in the year 7 BC, these planets are recorded as coming together three times. 
And not only this, they were joined in the following year, 6 BC, by Mars, making a striking sight in the night sky. And so the appearance of Mars might well have been the final sign of a new star in the east, heralding the birth of the Messiah. It is now accepted that the birth took place in 4 BC, the year of the Chinese supernova. And this is in harmony with the Magi's word to Herod that the child might then be up to two years old. The massacre of the innocents, babes of up to two years of age, followed the Magi's visit to Herod and is remembered for all time as a blot on world history, a crime which caused untold anguish throughout the Jewish world of Palestine. Another sinister sign of the age-old clash between good and evil which cast its shadow over the coming centuries. Jews had been in Iraq, known in those days as Babylonia, from the beginning of the 6th century BC. So it is possible that the Magi were of Jewish extraction, in which case the astronomical evidence would have been compelling. Their traditional symbols would have left no room for doubt in their minds. Jupiter, the royal star, Saturn, the guardian of Israel, and Pisces, the sign of Israel's Messiah. It was enough. They were soon on their way westwards, and the nativity itself took place almost certainly in October, not December, in the year 4 BC. The New Testament takes up the story. Jesus and his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, were protected by her husband Joseph, the carpenter, about whom little is known. They fled to Egypt, as we know, and returned in the spring of 3 BC, shortly after the death of Herod. But there is another Joseph of Arimathea who is the central character of this story. According to the Talmud, and also by tradition, he was the Virgin Mary's uncle. He became the protector and leader of Christianity in the West, initiating the great commission of the Christ to his disciples in the early years and centuries of the Christian era. This Joseph we know much more about. Could it be that he brought the Christ child to Britain in his early years, not once, but perhaps several times, as tradition affirms, during the 18 unrecorded years in the life of Jesus before his two and a half years of public ministry? There is New Testament evidence that Jesus was regarded almost as a stranger, even in his own hometown of Capernaum, which suggests that he might have been away from Palestine for some time. If these traditions are true, then the west of England would not have been a foreign land to either Jesus or his great uncle, but a place of hospitality, and for Joseph, later, a place of refuge. Britain, even in those far-off days, was known throughout the Roman world as a place with centuries of commerce, learning and culture, as well as artistic achievement far in advance of that produced by Rome. One has only to see the delicate intricacies of Celtic art to give the lie to the generally held belief that the ancient British were painted savages. Joseph of Arimathea plays a vital role in the dramatic events following the crucifixion of Christ. He was the one who went boldly to Pilate, the governor, and received authority to lay the body of Jesus in his own tomb. He is described in the New Testament as a rich man and a secret follower of Christ, although he was a member of the Sanhedrin the policy-making council of the Jewish world in Palestine and overseas. The tradition held strongly in the west of England that Joseph of Arimathea was engaged in the export of Cornish tin to the eastern Mediterranean may well account for his title, Nobilis de Curio, given him by Jerome in the fourth century. This title was bestowed upon a number of senior people who held office in the Roman Empire. In Joseph's case, 
This would be because of his responsibility for supplying metals. He was a kind of minister for mines. Some believe that he was uncle to the Virgin Mary, a concept which is supported by two old manuscripts, one in the British Museum and the other in Jesus College, Cambridge. His request for the body of Christ confirms this belief, as it was the Jewish custom for the closest relative of an executed person to remove the body. It was, in fact, a duty to do so. If Joseph was indeed the closest relative of the Virgin Mary, it would explain the Sanhedrin's silence on this matter and the approval of such a request by Pilate, the leading representative of the Roman Empire in Palestine. Cornwall has been famous for the finest quality tin since the days of the Phoenicians and Carthaginians who came to these shores in the centuries before Christ or even earlier, but this was surface mining. It was not until the 18th and 19th centuries that the familiar engine house and stack became a Cornish landmark. It was not long ago that during the process of pouring molten tin, the workers would chant, Joseph was in the tin trade, or Joseph was a tinner, as a sort of incantation possibly to help them produce ingots without blemish. Evidence of a tin trade between the Britannic Isles and the Eastern Mediterranean exists in this massive ingot of tin dredged up from the bottom of Falmouth Harbour near St. Moors. It's dated to the middle of the first century AD while Joseph was still alive. There was little difficulty in transporting such ingots from Britain to the Mediterranean. There were fleets of coastwise sailing craft in those days of a type similar to this model in Colchester Museum, continually plying between Palestine, Egypt, Greece and the Western Mediterranean ports. Today, all this rich, flat pasture land has long since been reclaimed from the sea, but in the first century, due to the extremely high tide in the Bristol Channel, the highest tide in all Europe, it was a maze of marshes and low-lying islands connected by waterways. These were deep enough at full flood to float a ship able to carry a cargo of ingots from the foot of the Mendips down to the Severn Estuary. Diodorus Siculus, a first century BC Roman historian and traveller, describes how metal was beaten into squares and carried in mule-drawn wagons to an island joined at low tide to the mainland. This could have been St. Michael's Mount off the Cornish coast at Marazion, or the high ground such as Gardney near Glastonbury, which at high tide was cut off from the mainland and became an island. From there it was transshipped across the channel to the Loire, or port on the Brittany coast. Then by mule train across to the River Rhone, down the river as far as Marseille, and then again by sea to Mediterranean ports. This tin trade was written about as early as 450 BC by Herodotus and later by Aristotle and others who referred to these islands as the Cassiterides, the tin islands. Sir Edward Creasy in his History of England writes, the British mines mainly supplied the glorious adornment of Solomon's temple which takes us back at least to 1000 BC. So much for the traditional and historical background. The incentive for communication between Palestine and Britain had been firmly established because of this trade and the prosperity it brought. The means of transporting precious metal was also firmly established along a route pioneered by the enterprising Phoenicians, which remained for several centuries under the watchful eye of Roman arms as were many other such routes during the Pax Romana. The traditions which link Joseph to Cornwall and Somerset make it possible to reconstruct what might have happened. After many years spent in commerce, involving voyages on the high seas, visiting Mediterranean and Western ports, Joseph finds that he has to leave his home for good because of his connection with Christ and his followers. 
who appeared to be turning their world upside down, the Jewish and the Roman world of Palestine. They were regarded as a subversive force which had to be suppressed. So, what better haven than to be with his friends in the far west, to whom he could now relate the dramatic events which led to Christ's death and his even more dramatic resurrection, witnessed by so many people. Being already familiar with the West Country, Joseph readily follows the suggestion of his friend and companion St. Philip, the Apostle to the Gauls, and crosses the channel from France by the trade route already known to him, and once again comes to Yenis Witrin, the ancient Isle of Avalon, or Glastonbury, as we know it today. So he and his companions are given a grant of land by the local king, Arviragus, on which to set up their Christian community, perhaps because he was already well known and well disposed to Joseph in his role of tin trader. Arviragus is shown here in St. John's Church, Glastonbury. It is not recorded whether the court of Arviragus accepted this new faith, but there was obviously something different in Joseph's bearing, a new look in his eye, a nobility that deeply impressed the king. The gift of land was, in fact, 12 hides, one for each of the group. A hide of land is about 120 acres, or as much as a team of oxen could cultivate in a year. The eastern boundary of the 12 hides is marked by this stone in Pilton Parish Church graveyard. There is a link between this gift of land and a statement in the Doomsday Book, for on folio 90 there is an account of the properties of the Abbey at Glastonbury. It states in Latin, the Domus Dei, the great monastery at Glastonbury, called the secret of our Lord, this Glastonbury church hath in its own villa twelve hides of land which have never paid tax. Could this be Joseph's land? William Blake was so impressed with the story of Joseph's flight to Britain that it became the subject of one of his first engravings entitled Joseph of Arimathea amongst the rocks of Albion. On the original engraving, Blake wrote, Michelangelo painted it. So the Italian school must have known the story, 16th century. Joseph's adoption of Britain as his final place of work and service is commemorated in some West Country churches. In the parish church at Weston, Bath, Joseph is shown with his followers, some of whom are women, holding his famous staff which is bursting into blossom as he thrusts it into the fertile soil of Somerset. It is believed that cuttings were taken, planted and replanted from the original flowering staff, the little trees being miraculously preserved, and that in this way the original stock has survived throughout the ages. And today, in the grounds of the old Benedictine Abbey, the holy thorn is still growing. It is a genuine Levantine thorn, Cretagus prycox, and it blossoms twice a year at Christmas time and May. For many years, a picturesque little ceremony used to take place when a cutting was taken from the holy thorn and presented to the reigning sovereign. This custom had already fallen into disuse, but was reinstituted by the command of His Majesty King George V, and now, every year, a sprig of this historic little tree is sent to Her Majesty the Queen as a Christmas decoration placed usually on Her Majesty's desk. Where the main road winds round the base of Wirral Hill at Glastonbury was probably a muddy, marshy beach. Here, it is affirmed, Joseph and his companions, weary after their long voyage through France, landed from their craft. An incident remembered in the name of the hill, Wirral, or Weary All. Or the word might be derived from Withy, sometime called Wirral, used in making the earliest settlement huts. 
On the top of the hill, a little tree grows. A cutting from the holy thorn in the abbey grounds, marking the place where Christianity arrived in England in AD 36, long before the mission of St. Augustine in 597 AD. Our own historian Gildas, who lived in the 6th century, writes, We certainly know that Christ, the true Son, afforded his light, the knowledge of his precepts, to our island in the last year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. As Tiberius died in AD 37, the light must have come to these islands before that. Joseph is said to have ended his days in this green and pleasant land, and both he and his companions are believed to have been buried at Glastonbury. In 540 AD, Mylgwyn of Avalon wrote in his Historia de Rebus Britannicus, The Isle of Avalon, greedy for burials, received thousands, amongst whom was Joseph de Marmory of Arimathea, who entered his perpetual sleep and lies in a forked line next the southern angle of the oratory made of wattles. This oratory made of wattles was a simple rectangular wattle and daub structure built by Joseph and his companions. The first Christian church constructed in Britain for worship without fear of persecution and attack and may well have been the first Christian church above ground in the world. Sir Robert Wingfield was the British ambassador to the Emperor Maximilian in 1517 during the reign of Henry VIII. He had the proceedings of the Council of Constance in 1417 carefully recorded in a book. The record includes the statement that Joseph of Arimathea brought the Christian faith to Great Britain immediately after the Passion of Christ. Statim post passionem Christi. How strongly this belief was held in the Church of England that this wattle and door building was founded by Joseph was made clear at the time of the Lambeth Conference in 1897. In recognition of this ancient ground, Her Majesty the Queen presented this simple wooden cross as a memorial. The cross, the symbol of our faith, the gift of Queen Elizabeth II, marks a Christian sanctuary so ancient that only legend can recall its origin. This is St. Mary's Chapel, erected by order of King Henry II over the spot where it is believed Joseph was buried. A 14th century Lincolnshire monk, Roger de Boston, claimed in one of his writings that he saw a metal plate attached to a great stone sarcophagus, such as this, and on which was engraved these lines in Latin. I came to the Britons after I buried the Christ. I taught. I rest. Quite obviously, an enormous amount of respect was paid to this sacred corner of Somerset by kings, clergy and people alike. Indeed, King Canute signed a royal charter seated inside the old Wattle Church in 1032 AD, as did King Ina in 704, nearly five centuries before the famous abbey was burned down. When eventually St. Augustine reached the West Country, he found somewhat to his surprise an already flourishing Celtic Christian church and community. And so impressed was Paulinus, Augustine's companion, with the old Wattle Church they found there, that in the year 633, he had it boarded over with a lead roof for protection. There was lead in abundance only a few miles away in the Mendip Mines, just north of Wells. Of this ancient wood and wattle church, St. Augustine wrote to Pope Gregory, in the western confines of Britain, there is a certain royal island of large extent, surrounded by water and abounding in all the beauties of nature and necessaries of life. In it, the first neophytes of Catholic law found a church constructed by no human art, but by the hands of Christ himself. By the hands of Christ himself? What was it, one wonders, that inspired a medieval chronicler to write, truly, Glastonbury is the holiest earth of England. Read St. David's life, and there may ye see that our Lord it hallowed with his own hand. Some centuries later, the greatest of tragedies struck this historic building. All was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1184, including probably the greatest collection of manuscripts in these islands. Immediately, King Henry II issued a royal charter that the abbey at Glastonbury should be rebuilt 
as it was, in his own words, the mother and burying place of the saints, founded by the very disciples of our Lord. This model in Glastonbury Museum is how it looked. On the site of the Wattle Church, where later St. Mary's Chapel was built, special services are held each year in the crypt on a commemorative day when the Church of England sends representative choirs to Glastonbury to take part in an annual ceremony of rededication, thus perpetuating a practice that has continued for nearly 2,000 years. Cardinal Pole and Polydor Virgil, a 16th century historian, were both Roman Catholics, and they claimed that Britain was the first country to be converted to Christianity. Before Philip of Spain and Mary, under a cloth of state, and the assembled lords and commons in the great chamber of Whitehall, the cardinal, who for a brief period was also Archbishop of Canterbury, made the following statement. The see apostolic, from whence I come, hath a special respect to this realm above all others, and not without cause, seeing that God himself, as it were, by providence, hath given to this realm prerogative of nobility above all others, which to make plain unto you, it is to be considered that this island, first of all islands, received the light of Christ's religion. As for the belief that Jesus of Nazareth may have lived amongst us as a young man, there is strong support from William of Malmesbury, a 12th century historian of Glastonbury's past. In his account of King Enos Charter, he tells us that an unnamed personage described as a great high priest and chiefest minister, once upon a time sanctified the ancient church at Glastonbury to himself and the Virgin Mary. Could it be that this great high priest was Jesus of Nazareth? And why this statement in the Doomsday Book, calling Glastonbury the secret of the Lord? There's no doubt that Jesus, as a young man, would have found the peace and beauty of Glastonbury a great contrast to the hot, dusty, and certainly unstable political scene in Palestine, which he knew awaited him. Here, then, he may have constructed for himself a wood-framed wattle hut in similar style to the wattle hut dwellings of the British Lake Village remains found at Mere and at Godney, near Glastonbury. The word Godney means Godmarsh Island. Note, not Marsh Island, which one might expect, but Godmarsh Island. It is possible that Joseph and his companions, well aware that the young Jesus had lived here some years previously, made their way to the partially ruined hut in which he had lived and erected the first Christian church over this hallowed spot soon after their arrival in or about 36 AD. From the time that the young Jesus was presented at the temple at the age of 12 until his public ministry at about the age of 30, a period of 18 years, both the Bible and secular history are silent. There is no record of where he was or what he was doing. There are certain passages in the New Testament which suggest that he might have been away from Palestine for part of this long period. If this is true, and given the business interests of his great uncle and guardian, it is neither unlikely nor unnatural that he should accompany Joseph on some of his voyages. In fact, it is more difficult to reject this than to believe it, especially as it is widely held that the first Joseph and husband of his mother died soon after his twelfth birthday. It certainly does not preclude the possibility that he might have come to Britain, and there are many places in the West where this faint story lingers of Joseph and the young Jesus. There is even a tradition that during this 18-year period he visited India and Tibet. There is also an intriguing story in some of the villages of Upper Galilee that as a youth Jesus came to Britain as a shipwright aboard a trading vessel of Tyre and that he was storm-bound on the shores of the west of England throughout the winter.
At Loo, on the South Cornish coast, the locals used to say of long-haired people, go and get your hair cut, or folks will say, it is Joseph of Arimathy come back. <laughs> Loo is divided by the Loo River into the East Loo and West Loo. East Loo has as its coat of arms the ship bringing, so it is thought, Joseph and the young Jesus to Cornwall. And this is also portrayed on the front of the old guild hall. The painting, verified by the town clerk, shows the badge as it should be, Jesus and Joseph of Arimathea aboard their trading vessel. A mile off Lou is St George's Island. Some of the older folk of the district were heard to say that when they were children, they'd been told by their parents and grandparents that Joseph and the young Jesus had landed on St George's Island. One fragment of the story at Lou went like this. The locals heard that a boy and his uncle had landed on the island, and they were so anxious to protect them that they went to the giants and asked them to build a hedge to shelter them. For when the wind blows in the southwest, it really blows. Now, whether or not you believe that giants existed, the fact remains that there is a great and ancient earthwork running up over the bare Cornish hills and down to the Fowey Valley. It's called the Giant's Hedge. The hedge is factual. Place Manor near Falmouth has a very ancient history. An early Celtic Christian monastery was situated here, and before that a Druidic centre, where also tin and lead were collected for export. On the curve of the Saxon or early Norman arch of the Manor Chapel are carved ancient signs indicating a possible connection with the visitors from Palestine, an anchor, a palm tree, and the lamb and flag insignia. It is believed that they tell the story of Joseph and Jesus running into a storm off St Anthony's Head, where the lighthouse now stands, forcing them to seek shelter in the lee of the headland where Place Manor and its church are situated. A fascinating echo, or even origin, of a tradition that has long been held in faraway Galilee. There are those amongst the older folk of the district, St Justin Roseland, who will still repeat the age-old beliefs. Christ came in a ship and anchored in St Just Creek. Across the water from St Just, there is another fragment of the tale. For at Falmouth, this odd little story was brought to light. Joseph of Arimathea and the young lad Jesus from Nazareth landed at the Strand, now the town quay crossed the stream and went up Smithick Hill. The origin of this curious little expedition seems to have been lost, but the ascent of Smithick Hill, then just a grassy slope, seems to have remained in the local memory. In far west Cornwall, there are, or were, two rich loads or veins of tin. One was named Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, and the other, Wheel Jesus, Wheel is the old Cornish word for mine. Dotted about the tin mining area of Cornwall are a number of very ancient Celtic crosses by the roadside and in country churchyards of a type found nowhere else in the British Isles. They're called tunic crosses. The highest concentration of these crosses is found in the most ancient tin mining areas. On one side, a crudely cut Christian cross. On the other, the figure of what can only be a boy, certainly not an adult, dressed in a knee-length tunic. Not a crucified Christ nailed to a cross, but a youth, his arms outstretched in an attitude of blessing. Could these be portrayals of an age-old memory of the visits of the young Christ Jesus to these shores in the far west? Even the name Penzance tells the story, for Pen means headland, 
and Zans is probably a corruption of the word Sanctus, holy, thus holy headland. This ancient concentration of hut circles on the south side of the hills, just above Penzance, is the Celtic village of Chai Sauster, and is only a mile from the Ding Dong Mine, where the locals say, Jesus worked as a miner. Such a peaceful village might well have provided the boy Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, the officials and workers, with their evening meal and night's rest. Now, it wasn't just for that traders from the Mediterranean came to these islands, for there were rich deposits of lead and copper in the Mendip Hills of Somerset, which had been worked for many centuries before the Christian era. Although there was an overland route for ordinary traffic, the easiest way, and the cheapest, for the transport of heavy metals would be round Land's End, and with the prevailing southwesterly wind, up the Bristol Channel, a quick and easy passage on a rising tide. As a sailor, Joseph would have made a special point of knowing just where he could obtain fresh water and supplies, so he might have put his ship into the broad estuary of the River Camel at Padstow to replenish his water casks. Near the mouth there is a well, which through the ages had been venerated as a sacred spot and has been the focal point for pilgrimages. It is called Jesus' Well. But the story is not only concentrated in Cornwall, for in the little mended village of Priddy, there used to be a local saying, as sure as our Lord was a pretty. Just as a countryman might emphasize a point in his conversation by saying, as sure as eggs is eggs. At pretty can be seen the remains of the workings where Britons mined lead for export to the Middle East. Certainly mining was going on here in Joseph's time. This beautiful story of the young Christ's visit to Britain is depicted in fine needlework on a church banner in Pilton Parish Church near Priddy. Joseph of Arimathea is shown landing from his ship near Glastonbury and with him is the boy Jesus. Sir Robert Wingfield, the British ambassador to the Emperor Maximilian in Henry VIII's time, records another interesting statement. Immediately after the Passion of Christ, Joseph of Arimathea, the noble de Curio, proceeded to cultivate the Lord's vineyard, that is to say, England, and converted the people to the faith. Now, why should England be called the Lord's vineyard? It is a curious name, but whatever the reason is, there were vineyards on the south side of Wirral Hill at Glastonbury during the Middle Ages. And even today, there are at Pilton flourishing vineyards producing very delicately flavoured wines. If the young Jesus did in fact live a quiet life here in the peace and solitude of Avalon, then for purely practical reasons he had to have a good water supply. There is such a well called the Chalice Well at the foot of Glastonbury Tor, which has never run dry within human memory. The well takes its name from the chalice or cup of the Last Supper, which some believe was brought to this country by Joseph, the one priceless possession in memory of that poignant Last Supper. It is thought that King Arthur and his friends knew of this and made an exhaustive search for it. Centuries later, this story became romanticized as Mallory's search for the Holy Grail in Mort Dartha. There are those who believe that the Nanteos cup, the Cupan Nanteos, is the veritable cup itself. A simple little wooden bowl of battered olive wood, broken and black with age, a far more likely receptacle for wine than the mythical gem-encrusted goblet of the Mort Dartha fables. There is a long list of early Celtic missionaries who were trained at Glastonbury. Many of these travelled all over Europe, even as far as the heel of Italy. St. Patrick, the Apostle to Ireland and first real abbot of Glastonbury. St. Aidan and his pupil St. Cuthbert of Lindisfarne. 
St. Brendan, a Scottish missionary sailor, St. Bride of Kildare and of Fleet Street, St. Dunstan, St. Columba of royal blood and countless others. Glastonbury remained untouched, though all around the country was ravaged by the Romans, the Danes, Angles and Saxons. Some of the early Celts fled back to France, which might well explain the close affinity between the Bretons and the Cornishmen. But if in this age of cynicism, darkness and anxiety, we can pause for breath, we might with advantage look back at the light which so richly illuminated these islands in the early centuries. It is a light which has burned brilliantly from time to time through the lives of individuals, a history in the making by people who believed passionately that the light which shone 2,000 years ago was more than adequate to remake the world. Is it not possible, if not imperative, that Britain and all the other Western nations who hold these Christian traditions should find our role in the community of nations? If these islands cradled the Christian faith in the West in its early years, this is a great and sacred heritage for which we are accountable. Perhaps there is a smouldering fire that can still be found into flame. The world is in desperate need of this light, but it has to come and will come through a growing number of individuals who let this light into their lives. This alone will create the national and international climate in which justice, law and order, compassion and care of the earth's resources will prevail.